All right, by now, guys, you know, I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be fun. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back or one day we want to upgrade to hardwood floors or remodel the kitchen or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know, you can do better with the mortgage though. You may not know this. The interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments, buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. Or Hey man, shoot me an email directly. Conrad at savewithconrad.com. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the hardcore legend himself, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing great wearing uh, the Mr. In Your House shirt again, but without the eyeglasses, which gives me a completely different look totally than different. last. Usually, I would go into your beautiful uh, restroom here at uh, First. Right. First family mortgage. First family mortgage where you have the heated toilet seat. And come on. Uh, but I will change shirts to give the impression that it's a different day. I think our followers are too good to be lied to in that manner. We kind of told them last week, too, what we yeah. were doing. Because yeah. as we're going to tape tomorrow, the Foley Weight Loss Challenge begins. So this is your last You're, you're going to bring the scale in the tomorrow. The scale will be here oh, tomorrow. Nice. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. And... Uh, and, and yeah, we're going to, we're going to get started. And something else I know we're looking forward to getting started is talking about Dresselmania. Dresselmania. It's coming up very, very soon. It's after night one of Wrestlemania in Los Angeles at the fabulous Biltmore hotel, the WrestleCon hotel, the site where all the wrestling fans in the world are going to be gathered for the entire week of Wrestlemania. And you and Mickey James are getting together for a really, really great cause. We sure are. Uh, I, I, do you know, have the name of her, the specified charity? I know it's a great one. and it, We'll have all the information. We'll have all the information. Yeah. Uh, Mickey reached out to me, and she knew that we had, you and I had that Saturday night reserved. Yes. Uh, for kind of like a live wrap-up type show, post-WrestleMania first night. And Mickey was explaining she had this thing, WrestleMania, we're going to uh, raise money for a really good cause. So she was hoping that maybe we could find a way for her and uh, and uh, the grown-ass women 
uh, <laughs> uh, help me out here to Victoria and uh, um, SoCal Val. Yes. Yeah, the, gro- the, the known collectively as grown ass women. So I talked to you. And you were like, well, Mick, I'm only doing it because I'm trying to, I, I wanted to get you a payday. I was like, ah, Conrad, I'd rather help Mickey out Let's than do, do the thing. And it was like, so Mickey's getting the thing, like the message, instead of saying, yeah, you can have a little bit of time, like, do you want the show? Like, yes. would you like me to host the show? Yes. And it was one of those feel good moments all the way around where I'm like, you don't even have to go to Mania, so you can watch it in your reclining chair. Yeah, absolutely. You were only going to go to help me, and I would rather help Mickey. Granted, yes. I, I'm counting on doing pretty well at, You're gonna uh, do fine at, at the four days. I'm going to be okay anyway, so we're really looking forward to this. Mickey's a wonderful young lady. She's got a great family there uh, with Nick and Donovan. You know, I may or may not have a... Uh, Harness talk to Santa who paid them a Christmas Eve visit that I think they uh, really appreciated. And she's been through a really tough time with the death of her brother and her niece. And just a good hearted, grown ass woman uh, who's going to be raising some money along with Val and Victoria. And I'm going to be hosting that. So, and the proceeds uh, go to help autistic folks who uh, are, are looking for an opportunity. And of course, the way that uh, I think Mickey got first involved with this is they had an opportunity for these folks to enjoy horses, which of course is a yeah, passion for yeah. Mickey James, and now she's all in. And in our brainstorming sessions this last week, Mick, we agreed we were going to get together some pretty unique items that fans could bid on, and all the proceeds go there. So we'll do a, a live auction there at the event, but also online leading up to it. So if you can't make it to WrestleMania, uh, and you can't attend WrestleMania, which I think is going to be the ultimate post WrestleMania party. I think so. Because she's got some big plans for some surprise guests and some fun stuff. And it's all happening at WrestleCon right after night one of WrestleMania at the Biltmore in LA. We've got all the details here at WrestleMania.com, and you'll see all those details there. So, how you could make a donation, pick up a ticket, or bid on some of these one-of-a-kind items, including some ring use stuff that I'm donating out of our collection. Wow. So, wow really nice. cool opportunity to raise some money for a great cause. It's really, everyone wins. So I had a big smile on my face. You and I were going back and forth on the uh, texting, and we realized we found a solution that worked for everybody. We Win-win. Were, ah, we were really happy. So Dresselmania it is. And, of course, somebody who would be smiling knowing that we're doing something for charity like that is our subject today, Mrs. Stephanie McMahon. (laughs) Uh, I'm so glad we get to talk about her. Of course, everyone knows her story, and they know that seemingly she's uh, left the wrestling business, and now she's, quote-unquote, just a fan where it all began for her. And I think, man, what a great way to honor her and talk about all the good times uh, of Stephanie McMahon's career. But something you said to me in passing before we clicked record today, is that once upon a time, Stephanie didn't think you liked her. That's right, yeah. Uh, well, what's that story? What's now, that about? No, I don't know if she would feel comfortable with me relaying this story, but I think it it's a nice story, so I want to tell it. Uh, it came about because I submitted a story to WWE for one of two stories that later became my Tales from Rusko Lane uh, children's book, and one was uh, called Dudley's Do Right. And it was about the Dudleys uh, wrecking Stephanie's collectible sale where she is selling an assortment of <laughs> some of her dad's junk and gimmicks that didn't get over. You know, there's like, uh, uh, the Dudleys come to uh, ransack it and I says that, and it was, uh, let me see, the toupee, it was torn, the, uh, uh, the something was torn, to, was smashed to bits, the toupee, it was torn, the helmet, it was damaged to the one Farouk had worn. So we yes. got the blue helmet, Vince's yes. toupee, uh, Shane being the guy pointing his finger at the Dudleys, I'm going to tell my dad. And Stephanie just wants to raise money for this little uh, toy, honey bunny, a stuffed animal. And after I submit it, I know it wouldn't go on to be published for three more years because I had a falling out with the company. And right. When we mended fences, the first thing I asked Vince was, can we do that book now? And so it came out three years later than it should have. But Stephanie sees it in uh, 2001. And she calls me up and she goes, honest, I never thought you liked me. 
And I thought, I said, well, why would you feel that? It's funny because it, it feels funny to me to think that she thought I didn't like her all the way through my commissioner role. So this may have actually been 2000 when, uh, uh, when I was in between wrestling and commissioner. That would make more sense to me. And she said that, you know, when she was starting uh, on air uh, as, as talent and as, and as Triple H's manager, that she was used to doing things a certain way, which meant memorizing promos. And she's got like a memory, like an iron trap. Like she never forgets a thing. And I would go off script, partially because that's the way I did things, and partially because I couldn't always remember the promos. Right. And Stephanie took it personally, like I was doing it to make things more difficult to her on her or to slight her. And I said over the phone, I said, oh, no, you you always been one of my favorites. She had no idea. Wow. And she said she'd even mentioned it to her dad, and her dad was like, well, don't worry about Mick. Once he gets to know you, he'll appreciate you. But the truth is, I always liked her. Always thought that she, what she brought to the table as a talent on air was great. She started from the ground up. You know, uh, she was in marketing first. So even before she became part of creative, she was working as part of the marketing team and as an on-air talent. And then later became on-air talent and and um, and uh, uh, part of the writing team. But we had that really good period of time where she, when she came to TV, she and Triple H were hiding the relationship that we didn't know about until months later. So she had, she was just one of the guys. Right. And she was doing that phenomenal angle with Kurt Angle and the love oh, triangle, so which was so good. And there was just a lot of time to just, uh, you know, to, to talk and we became friends. I remember Noel making uh, a pot holder for Stephanie for her birthday. Stephanie says it's still there in the house somewhere and not wow. claiming it gets used a lot. But I always thought that was a really nice way into a friendship and really a friendship that has not had any, uh, I mean, ups and downs as far as, uh, you know, there have been times when I was more vocal with my displeasure about the show and I would sometimes text Stephanie, never to the point where I was a pain in the neck, but just because I loved the product and loved the company and wanted it to be good. Um, but I, you know, I reached out to her when she left and reached out to her when I heard that she had, uh, uh, had ankle surgery and she's somebody I consider to be a really, a really good friend and a, a really talented, and I, I consider her to be a great person, a really a great person who's capable and can do anything she wants in right. or out of the wrestling business. Well said, well said. When so now anyone who's tuning in to hear me shovel dirt will be disappointed. I have no interest and I have nothing bad to say about Stephanie. And if I did, I would have no interest in sharing it. So this is going to be kind of like a feel good thing, meaning it'll be the worst rated show we've done. <laughs> Mick, the show we did two weeks ago <laughs> would have to be, it, it was our it, worst. Well, you were adamant it was the worst one we've ever done. There's no way you think this show will be worse than that one. What was the show I thought was the worst? See, you don't even remember. I don't. I because you thought that we were going to be talking about when you were challenging. Oh, that was Stone right. Cold. When I did it uh, from home. We were doing the dumpster deal. You were on the road. Yeah, I was on the road. Hypothetically shooting a show, maybe. Maybe shooting a show maybe. that might be on A&E. When are they going to give me the green light to talk about this wonderful show we've been doing? We've been doing this for a year, it feels like, <laughs> and we've not yet been given the green light to talk about it. Uh, are, I guess the question is, Are you? is the show you're working on also called Godfather 4? Because it's it's an epic. Like, how many seasons of this damn thing are we doing? It's uh, taking a long time, but it's. I think it's going to be worth it. When this show debuts, it will be part of the, the what is it, the Sunday night yes. thing? Yes. On A and E, and I think it debuts in April. And I just hope that when uh, uh, I get the word that they want me to promote it, that you know, I I I believe wholeheartedly in this show. And I've seen one rough cut of one episode, and I think it looks tremendous. I mean, I'm a nitpicker to the point where I was like, oh, I couldn't have wiped that crumb off my black shirt. But that's as much as I can find to fault the show with. I think it's really well put together. We've got a great crew. I guess I'm officially talking about it. No, you're point. not. This is all no, hypothetical. Not. Okay, hypothetically. did you see season one? I did see. I was I was a guest on season one. Uh, 
I remember you were in a basement uh, looking for the Mankind shirt. I was looking for the Mankind shirt, right? With uh, Tim Jameson. That's right. Tim Jameson, who I still owe a visit to. Foley Pizza Party. T- Foley Pizza Party. Tim, at this point, has donated over $10,000 for three Foley Pizza Parties. So uh, when I go up to Indianapolis for the Squared Circle Convention in April, I'll go up and travel those uh, few extra miles to watch wrestling and hang out with Tim. But that was where I met Tim. Brother, Tim, you're breaking his heart when you take away. He these, loves he, it. He loves this What stuff. a great Instagram follow, too. I don't know if you've seen his Instagram. Account. No, no. That's is he tremendous. really good? Oh, it's really good. Okay. I don't know if he wants me to out his handle, but I'll, I'll tell you off air. Oh, off air. Okay. Maybe he does, and if okay. he does, we'll throw it on screen now. It's just incredible. You sit there and you watch. Well, you know what it's like is you've got an amazing collection but, but he's the, got a museum. He it is like a museum. It's fantastic. It is. It's it's incredible to be in his house. Um, when did you first meet Stephanie McMahon? Would it have been in '96? No, this is the cool. This is the really cool story. A real life meeting, and I end up using this during a promo. And the only thing I asked you to mention two things when I found out we were talking about Stephanie. One was the promo Vince didn't want us to cut, and the other one was asking like how she came to write the forward to uh, the last book I published. But when I gave that promo, I really believe in the realism and, you know, the borderlining that Terry Funk used to talk about because people could tell when things are true. And I talked about how I met Stephanie. It was right after Hell in a Cell. Now, I I said I still had a tooth stuck in my nose. I don't know if that was the case. But this is in between being thrown off and through the cell and when I came back out for the slowest, most pathetic run-in in in wrestling history. (laughs) (laughs) And I got the word that uh, Pat Patterson's, you know, longtime partner, Mm. Louie, had passed away. Now, for years, I thought Louie passed away during the show and that I was the cause of it, you know? Uh, I kept, I bore that burden for quite a while unnecessarily. But when I walked into Vince's office, um, Pat was just shaking. He was he was so upset, and I saw uh, and I gave Pat a big hug like this. And I looked over, uh, and I see Linda McMahon, and then I see this very nice young lady. And she said that even you know, she said I had the tooth stuck in my uh, nose. That I gave her a crooked little smile, and that was the first time I met Stephanie. Wow! In Vince's office after Hell in a Cell, but before I returned for the slowest, most pathetic run-in in wrestling history. That's unbelievable. What yeah. a night, man. Yeah. Uh, well, at just 22 years old, she becomes a television character. She's abducted by The Undertaker for the <laughs> Ministry of Darkness. Listen, we talk a lot on podcasts about the big shoes that second-generation stars have to fill, like a Dustin Rhodes behind a Dusty mm-hmm. or a David Flair behind a Ric Flair or uh, Bruno San Martino and the, the big shadow that he cast mm-hmm. over David and on and on. But now you're talking about really and truly the guy in professional wrestling. And now she's going to sort of dip her toe in the water and be asked to become a television character. Something that it's not like she, as far as I know, went to acting school or something like that. Uh, she's thrust into the limelight and what might be considered a little silly, you know, the undertaker is abducting her for the ministry of darkness. And this is when the company is white hot. They're hotter yeah. than ever. Mm-hmm. This is a lot of pressure for a young person. Is yeah. It not? And I'll say that Stephanie had the circumstances that in some ways made things easier, but in other ways made things more difficult. Yes. So when you talk about a uh, David in a uh, Rick's shadow, uh, when you talk about um, uh, David San Martino and yes. Bruno's shadow, Dustin and Dusty, Dustin's learning in large part away from his father's watchful eye. I mean, I know they did Florida together, but a lot of his growth was done hundreds of miles away from his dad. Same thing with Rick Rick sends uh, David off to Puerto Rico and David's getting his feet wet without Rick's watching eye all the time. Whereas Stephanie was under her father's watch all the time. And Vince is such a stern taskmaster. He's not going to give his children anything he doesn't think they deserve. He's not going to put them on the air until he thinks they're good and ready for it. 
And so I'll argue that Stephanie was a natural. She'd grown up in it. You know, I think the first time she's actually uh, seen behind the scenes even is in Beyond the Mat, mm -hmm. where you see a very young Stephanie, probably in her senior year. I think she went to Boston University. Uh, and she's just a sponge soaking up everything. And I just, uh, Stephanie had such an incredible work ethic. Like I said, her dad put her to work, uh, you know, in the marketing. There's actually a story, if I could tell you. This Please. is, this is uh, 2000. Um, I, I don't, it's, oh man, I hate to use this as a benchmark, but uh, it was right around Brian Hildebrandt's funeral. And okay. I can't remember if that was 2000 or 2001. But they wanted me to make an appearance in Orlando on Disney property, and they put us up in a two-bedroom at the boardwalk. So we had never treated ourselves to that kind of opulence. And all I had to do was make like a one-hour appearance. But when I get to the appearance, about 110 degrees. And I only had two differentiations in what I wore. I mean, I had multiple flannels, multiple T-shirts, but I was either in a flannel, T-shirt, and sweatpants, or tuxedo. <laughs> there was nothing in between. That's fantastic. So I bought the tuxedo. Vince Russo told me, you know, at Survivor Series 98, bro, I need you to get a suit. I went and bought a tuxedo. Bought it. I didn't rent it. And I wore that to just about every event. That's I fantastic. didn't know you weren't supposed to wear a tux to a funeral. And I did wear my tux to a couple of funerals because I didn't know any better. Uh, Who smartened you up? Uh, uh, I believe it was the look. I believe I was receiving a look, and then when I asked, they, uh, bro, you're wearing a tuxedo at a funeral. That's not proper form. No. So anyway, it's about 106 degrees or something like that. I'm just pouring sweat. I look like Kurt Angle cutting a promo, you know? Like, Kurt would just be saturated with perspiration. And Stephanie goes, Mick, you don't have to wear that jacket. I, ah, I don't know, Steph. And Mick, I feel terrible for you. You look so uncomfortable. I said, are you sure? Keep in mind who we're talking about here. I take off that tuxedo jacket, and I'm basically wearing a mankind shirt with the arms <laughs> ripped off, <laughs> all zigzagged at the bottom. It's like, you get what you get. You know, yes. Once the tuxedo's off, I am wearing a mankind shirt under there. But that was, a, you know, the trip that was cut short, but it was really nice of them to put us up and we turned it into a little family gathering. And I just, I always liked Stephanie. Always found her easy to talk to. And I don't know if she wants me telling this story. I don't know how much she wants, but she gave me her writer's notebook. Really? Her write like that's, I mean, Stephanie is a really good writer. And she had written some short stories and some poems. And the fact that she trusted me with that book, which I returned to the next TV taping, but it really meant a lot to her. And I remember writing her a letter because I'd uh, have a nice day, it already come out, and I said from one author to another. Wow. And she really appreciated that. So hopefully she doesn't listen to this and go, oh, he's just, you know, he's saying, you know, these aren't stories that are for public consumption. But uh, she's, it goes to say that I was, I considered her to be a good friend above and beyond what we did uh, professionally, uh, to this day, I consider her to be a good friend. Well, let's talk about the on-screen evolution of her character. She becomes involved with Test on air. Of course, Hunter's going to interrupt the wedding, the old drive through wedding. Um, was there a moment where you remember watching her on screen and thinking, she's coming to New York? Oh, home? yeah. Yeah, and this is maybe something we covered on a different episode but I think originally, and forgive me if we have already have or have not, originally the idea was supposed to be it had been a, uh, a rouge all along. You know, she's uh, double-crossing Vince. I told Stephanie it would be more heat if she said she, Hunter really turns me on. Like, it wasn't meant to happen, but along the way... And she re absorbed that, and she said, you think so? And I don't know who she went to after that, but she used that line, and that change skewed it just a little bit to where now she's making a choice, and it's an evil choice. I like that. You know, and I always thought the people who, who were not necessarily bad seeds, and Vince and I would, would argue over this multiple times over the years, and it will uh, culminate in uh, the one story I asked you to uh, question me about, with the promo, one of the best promos I think that I've given backstage. 
Um, but I always liked the idea that she was making a conscious choice to be evil, that it wasn't innate in her, it was a conscious choice. Well, let's talk about that story of the promo that... Yeah, that so I, I come back into the fold in 2016 as the general manager. Stephanie's going to be the commissioner. So you have the dueling brands. It was Shane came back to the hero's response, yes. which was phenomenal. There was no way that I could match the popularity of... Daniel Bryan, who was, you know, he was flying on a cloud at that time. So it's like Stephanie unveils Mick Foley as her, <laughs> as her GM, and then Shane unveils Daniel. And so we had people actively choosing sides, you know, the red brand, the blue brand. Like there was, there was real competition there, not just between the brands, but between the two McMahons, Shane and Stephanie. And so when, when Stephanie slapped Shane, she broke his eardrum. Like that stuff they say, maybe the stuff they say is scripted, but it's being said with conviction. And I believe it's coming from a, a very real place. I like storylines, like the Sammy storyline. I'm not trying to compare what I did with Stephanie to Sammy's storyline because it's been so well done. But essentially two weeks into our run as you know collaborators, we are being forced into a position where Stephanie has screwed me over. This is where Hunter shows up during my first or second week as uh, GM, interferes in the match that screws Kevin Owens out of the uh, Universal title, gives the title to uh, Seth Rollins. And now I'm in a position where I have to explain the unexplainable. Like, how, how is this relationship going to last beyond a third week? And I just, I believe in every I being dotted, every T, be, T being crossed. And I don't like the idea that she's just screwed me over. So I go to Vince and I plead my case and I get about 10% of what I've asked for. But before I go and talk to Vince, I talk to Stephanie and she goes, Mick, I talked to my dad. Like he just doesn't, he, Vince was a proponent of pure evil. And I think that's what he saw as being Stephanie's guidepost. You know, the desire to de decim emotionally de decimate people. I thought we needed more room to grow. I come out of Vince's office after getting about 10% of what I wanted and Stephanie's waiting and she's got a crew with her. She goes, Mick, let's, let's do it our way. She's going behind, behind her dad's back and we're gonna cut this behind, behind, uh, backstage promo. It did take us two takes. I'd like to say it took us just one, but it was all that real stuff about the uh, uh, meeting up after uh, the, the hell in a cell, the tooth in the nose, the shy smile, and it just felt like it was working while we were doing it. And who comes walking out of his office just as we're finishing up? Oh. Mr. McMahon, he goes, what's going on here? And Stephanie goes, Dad, uh, Mick and I just thought we would try it one way, one time our way. And I'm telling you, Conrad, it was like the longest three minutes with Vince just staring at the, the monitor. And I go to walk away and he goes, where the hell are you going? I said, I'll be right here watching the monitor with you. He watches the three minutes. He, he, and it seemed to take 30 seconds. Maybe it was five or ten, but you know the way things are under yes. pressure. He nods his head and goes, we'll do it your way. And he's walking away, and Road Dog is one of the agents. He comes up to me and Stephanie, and he says, y'all know you can't get your way for like another six weeks. I said, just let him turn the corner. Let him turn the corner. And as soon as Vince turned the corner, Stephanie and I, oh, we just hugged because we felt like we had added some layers to that relationship and it may not have been everything everyone wanted for it and we were working in confines that i did not have when i working within confines that i didn't have when i was the commissioner where i could do anything i wanted as long as once in a while i, I you know i i got angry and made the matches i was supposed to ma make but in this case we bought ourselves some time and i think we created new dimensions to that character and I remember for the rest of the day, I kept looking around to see who smelled around me. And it wasn't, it was me. It was that, uh, you, you smell a different way when you're under stress. 
at least occasionally. And I was feeling the stress. It was uh, whatever it was, it was secreted. Like I only smelled that way a handful of times in my life, but I felt a lot of pressure that night because I wanted everything I did to, to be good. And I wanted this uh, GM role to work out. Um, I was in, oh man, the pain I was in as far as hip and, and second, secondarily the knee, the hip, it was just ungodly to where just getting up to do that, and I won't say it was ungodly, but it was pretty severe. So if I were to hop up to do my entrance, which was a simple entrance, but was asking a lot of me under those circumstances, I couldn't go out, even go out to dinner that night after the show because I'd be in so much pain. I would go immediately to the hotel room. I might grab something to eat, but I was watching my weight at that time. And it was just a pretty miserable existence. The traveling was really difficult on me. Uh, just getting around was really difficult. So I had to feel like the role was worth it, worth it and rewarding in other ways, which it was. And then I had a great send off. I mean, this is where when I finally make the decision to get my hip fixed, when a friend of mine who was uh, uh, who still is a uh, uh, a therapist um, and with a specialty in sports injuries. She said, that sounds like your hip. And I kept on saying, it's a lower back, lower back. And then she explained to me how your piriformis muscle can get tightened up, wrapped around, and it mimics a back injury. So when I went into the uh, doctor's office and I saw that x-ray, oh, it was like a big sigh of relief when I said, so I haven't been imagining this. And the guy says, no, this is the worst hip I've ever seen, which made me feel like a million bucks, you know? Because at least there was a reason. Yeah. And once there was a reason, then I was able to be treated. And as heavy as I've gotten, I'm feeling less pain than I did in 2016 for sure. But the first person I texted was Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, I've got to get this thing done. I won't be able to fly, be able to fly, because it's really dangerous to fly after surgery. I said, for about six weeks. The first thing she said was, don't worry about me. Do what you have to do. And I know like the cynics will be out there going, oh, well, of course, she's Stephanie McMahon. Like, of course she's gonna land on her feet. She always has, she always will. But she genuinely cared more about my health than she did about the role. And it was said, you know, Vince said the role will be waiting for me when I came back and it wasn't. But I also realized that it's kind of, when you're the GM, and I did not, I specifically asked Barry Bloom not to have a contract. I said, we're going to shake hands and we're going to do the role for as long as we both, you know, we, meaning me, Vince, Kevin Dunn, as long as we both feel like it's mutually beneficial. And so Kurt Angle came along as the shiny new toy and I accepted that. So on one hand, maybe I could have gotten paid for another six months for doing nothing. But I, I just like the idea that if you're not happy if somebody else can do it better, get that other person. Yeah, you know that I feel like it's like you serve at the. You know, they say you serve at the pleasure of the president. Well, you serve at the pleasure of Mr. McMahon. Yes, and he decided it was time for someone else to do the role, and I was pretty proud of what we'd done. Um, but always grateful that Stephanie's first impulse was to say, "Don't worry about me. Take care of yourself." And then we did get a great send off. So I was able to be fired on air, as we all should, and to do it with one of the best promos. Uh, the week before I was fired was one of, it was the first time I'd felt like I'd had a pay-per-view match after a promo. I felt that good about it. And uh, it was one of those things where it helped. I went out feeling like I'd done a service to the company so it further enhanced Stephanie as commissioner. Uh, it made Hunter look like a real SOB going into Mania against Seth. And it was able to give Seth a little boost going into Mania as well. So I felt really good about everything we did. So I want to circle back to something you were explaining earlier. The whole let's try shooting it our way, Mick, conversation. Yeah. And then you talked about being really stressed afterwards to the point where you could smell the stress yeah. on you. Do you think that stress was because, A, you hoped that your and her vision was better received by the audience, or B, because you had also, quote unquote, crossed the boss? It was partially because of crossing the boss. Yeah. I mean, that was, uh, man, we, that was, uh, it was a, quite a chance and really a gutsy move on her part 
um, for deciding to do it that way. So the one other thing I, I asked you, I said, <laughs> just ask me about the T-shirt I was wearing at the hotel. Yeah. And I believe I told this story. I've told it a handful of times at my live shows, but it's not like a go-to story. Right. But I, I did tell it, I think, what was the, the, it wasn't Top Guys Weekend, it was uh, StarCast. Oh, yeah, StarCast in Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago. StarCast 3. So I went and I, I put together a handful of stories. It was a brand new show. Yeah. And, I, and it was, man, I thought for the first time I told these stories, it went really well. But this is a 100% true story. I saw something pop up on my feed with a Stephanie McMahon shirt. And it just says something about if you're a Stephanie McMahon fan and were born in June, I don't know why, I, I but I ordered this shirt. It's not a WWE shirt. Stephanie doesn't see any money from it, but it's a way for me to proudly proclaim that I'm a Stephanie McMahon guy. I go, I check into a hotel with, uh, with Colette and the kids, and I'm not a real nuisance. Like maybe one out of every 20 times I go to a hotel, I go back down. I said, the room smells like smoke. And they go, well, it's a non-smoking hotel. I said, I don't doubt that. I'm just telling you somebody was smoking in the room. Well, no, 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 somebody, 95% of the time, I'm pretty happy with the hotel room. But in this case, the air conditioner's not working. Jacksonville in the summer oh. is an issue. So I, I make a phone call and the guy knocks on the door and he says, we're gonna move you to a different room. I go walking down the hall and he sees my Stephanie McMahon shirt. He goes, Stephanie McMahon, I can't stand her. I said, well, maybe she's just really good at uh, doing her job. She goes, oh, I think she and Triple H are running that company to the ground. And I don't know whether the guy's messing with me or not. Right. So he says completely unprompted, you know who I like is Mick Foley. <laughs> and he also throws Shamrock's name in there. All right, I, uh, interest in full disclosure. You know who I like is Mick Foley. So I go, I got to agree with Ric Flair about that guy. He is... <laughs> It's a glorified stuntman. Stunt At which point, I think this guy's about to fight me, and he goes, did you see what he did in Wrestle? Oh, first thing I said is, that guy is so overrated. And that's where he goes, did you see what he did during Hell in a Cell? And that's where I go, I got to side with Ric Flair. That guy's an over, he's a glorified stuntman. And at this point, I'm looking at the guy, and I see how angry yes. he is. Now, I've, I've got the short hair, not like the long hair I used to have. And I finally go, dude, you know I'm him. And he acts as if he'd been hit with a double-barreled shotgun. It literally takes him off his feet where he takes a bump on his butt. He and falls he, down. He falls down. He's so surprised that he wasn't working me. These are his actual real thoughts. And so I'm in that <laughs> incredible position where I'm arguing about me to somebody who's sticking up for me. Yes. And it all started because he saw that I had the Stephanie McMahon shirt on. I bet he said, I think mankind was better than Sting. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were just back at it, man. How are we doing on that poll? I think you're winning. But uh, it's my show. That's well, why. If, we, if me and Grillo can't show for you, who can? Oh, man. All the way in the Grillo position back there. All uh, the, the way in the Grillo, Grillo position. position. All but right. All right. I, uh, here's the thing, though. We both can't put this over enough. It's not glorified. It's the real deal. You and I talk about it all the time off air. Henson shaving. Oh, yeah. And, you know, listen, they do have some copy here. We'll get to it. But you and I were talking off air because I love this razor so much that I was telling my dad about it. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to get him one. And you and I were fortunate enough to be sent razors with a whole year supply of blades. Yeah. So I never actually bought one. Mm -hmm. I went to the website and I was blown away at how affordable it is. I don't want to say the number here. I want you to go check it out for yourself. It's over at hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley. But when you use our code Foley, you also get a hundred free blades. Now, Mick, that's going to last me more than a year. Yeah. But I started to just think about how much I was spending on razors when I just went down to the supermarket and bought my old stupid plastic obsolescent piece of crap disposable razors. But I was spending, I know for sure, like $20 every other month. Mm -hmm. So that's like $120 a year where you have a one year investment right up front in this razor and a hundred blades. But next year, a hundred blades is $5. Five man. bucks. Yeah. How do you beat that? So this is not only better, <sighs> yeah. but it's cheaper, right? I would like people to go and look at like uh, 
interviews I did before I began the show and before yes. they started sponsoring our show, because I almost always would let the side come in for yes. a week or two, maybe more. Major reason being, once I got past the three day mark, the disposables, they didn't really do anything. They get clogged so easily. I get to the other side of my face and there usually be patches that were not trimmed and I'd have to go and buy more. And when I use this, I did the <coughs> live demonstration, the dry, yeah. dry shaving. I don't use any any shaving cream when I use this and I actually like it. It takes less than a minute for me to get everything going and it's just cool for me to see how well, you have to respect it. You yes, have to understand. it's a real item. Yeah. It's a real item. Uh, so you have to be respectful of it. Don't leave it places where it can be found. You know, treat it like you would a, a firearm. I'm being serious. Like, you, you don't want kids wandering into it. But, it's a uh, real razor. It's a real razor. It's old school, man. That's what I yeah. like about yeah. it is, you know, these are, I don't know, but I imagine these are the type blades that once upon a time guys in wrestling would use. We can't. Except this is much better, because, and here's why. Like, Henson shaving is not, like, historically just like a, a shaving company. Before they were doing this, man, they're a family-owned business that has made parts for the International Space yeah. Station and the Mars rover. Yeah. So they're bringing that same precision engineering to your shaving experience. And we've learned through, through them sponsoring our show that razor blades are like diving boards, meaning the longer the board, the more the wobble, where the more the wobble, the more nicks and cuts and scrapes. Yeah. So you see a bad shave isn't a blade problem, it's an extension problem. But Henson Shaving uses aerospace grade CNC machines. So now Henson can make metal razors that extend just 0 0.0013 inches. It's less than the thickness of a human hair. And that means a more secure and stable blade with a vibration free shave. And it gets better. You were talking about how those plastic disposables clog up. Well, this razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. What you and I like about Henson Shaving is that they wanted to make the best razor, not the best razor business. That means there's no plastic here. This is substantial. This feels like the type of razor your grandfather would have used. They're not saying it's a lifetime warranty, but yeah. when you hold it, you're going to feel like, damn, this thing will last me forever. It will. Yeah. There's no subscriptions necessary. There's no proprietary blades and there's no planned obsolescence. This isn't the best razor business. This is the best razor. And it's a, a standard dual edge razor blade. It gives you that old school feel, but all the benefits of new school tech. And as we mentioned right at the top, this is only like three to five years for three to $5 a year for razor blades. Like this is a, a better shave and substantially cheaper, man. I love it. Um, yeah, you notice it once in a while we have a sponsor and I, I, I'm not familiar with the product. I'm happy they're sponsoring, but I can't really step forward and say, I love this, but I love the Henson. Uh, it's fantastic. Go out system. of your way. It's time to say no to subscriptions. It's time to say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com forward slash Foley. Pick the razor for you and use the code Foley. You'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G.com forward slash Foley and use the promo code Foley. We love it. We think you will too. I've already gifted one to my dad. Uh, I got a second one. I've got a copper one. I got the aluminum one. My buddy here in the office, he got a black one. My dad got a blue one. It's awesome, man. Go check it out. Hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley. So eventually Stephanie's going to turn heel. You sort of alluded to that earlier where she said, it turns me on. So you talked about that being the moment when you saw it sort of click for her. As Remember a that smile on her face? Yes. It's such a great. The McMahons have some great facial expressions. I don't know if it's in the DNA, but when that reveal comes and you, she's got that glint in her eye and it's like, that's the arrival of a star. Yes. To me, that's the arrival of a star. And then that angle uh, partnership with Triple H is a huge success on and off camera. And uh, then I have the good fortune to be uh, battling it out with her guy, and Stephanie has a the best seat in the house for a couple of the best matches in my career. Talk to me a little bit about uh, their re real life relationship. You talked about how they were once upon a time sneaking around, keeping it a secret. When did you know? Oh wow, this is real. 
a big show brought it up when uh, we were doing the rehearsals for Saturday Night Live, That's a, which was a huge springboard for The Rock's career. Obviously, it was a huge um, a huge opportunity, and he knocked it out of the park. I remember Big Show asking me that, and I thought, no. And then I realized that at a certain point, they stopped being as... Uh, lovey-dovey on air and I thought that's real because they are no longer as demonstrative because it has become real and I remember my wife actually saying something and uh, that's when, it, when I realized there might be something to that when they did not look as comfortable because in real life they'd become a couple that was just my takeaway on it right but they were, oh, God, what a, what a great power couple. Uh, and she was such a great addition to, to Triple H. Did her, could you see her or his personality change? Like you knew them before they were in a relationship. Now you see they're together. Did you notice a, a noticeable change? In I can't really say because I was gone after Mania. So okay. by the time I realized that they were a real couple, I wasn't really, uh, uh, when I came back, uh, you know, in June of 2000 as the commissioner, then I could, you know, then it was, I think it was out in the open. Or if it wasn't, at least uh, we behind the scenes thought that it was a real deal. I don't know if I could tell. Um, but I do believe that uh, she added quite a bit to Triple H. And if you're young and you're absorbing all your lessons like uh, Stephanie did, you couldn't have a better teacher than Triple H, who was such a student of wrestling. No doubt. Uh, in November of 2000, Stephanie becomes the head writer of the company, replacing Chris Kresge. Um, you had seen her in the marketing department. You had seen her trying to absorb everything like a sponge. You had seen her on camera. Were you surprised that she was now running creative? Well, I'd read her notebook, so I knew Stephanie had a keen mind and was a very um, um, cre creative person. Yeah, uh, Chris Kresge did a real good did a real good job. It was rumored that Chris Kresge co-wrote a few of the William Shatner novels. Not sure if you knew that or I not. I did not know that. Uh, and I believe the first thing that Stephanie contributed to was the uh, revelation that it was Rikishi who had run over I did it Stone Cold rock. Steve Austin. Yeah, yeah. Did it for The Rock. And I thought that was really well written. It may not have made sense. The reveal may, you know, you may point to some things, you know, and say the, uh, it shouldn't have been Rikishi. But I thought given that that's the name they came up with, they did a really good job. And uh, so I always encouraged Stephanie as a writer. Now, I wasn't there a lot. In, right. Well, she gained more and more um, stroke. I wasn't there for that. And I could understand. I see Stephanie through a certain lens. And she may have been tough on the writing staff that worked underneath her. I, I don't really know. I've heard she could be a little tough. But she's a McMahon. Like, you have to be tough. Right. And she's a woman in a man's world. And she... Uh, you know, and uh, I think she had to assert herself in that way. Uh, Stephanie, of course, is in Vince's corner uh, when he takes on his his son, Shane, at WrestleMania 17, which I believe you were the referee for. Yes. Um, who would have thought, here you guys are having your own little WrestleMania moment. <laughs> the evolution of her character is really something to see here. And she had been years. in uh, Triple H's corner when I did my one and only uh, Mania main event. There you go. In 2000. I had Linda in my corner. Uh, Shane was in Big Show's corner. And Vince, of course, was in The Rock's corner. Uh, but you're right. As the, the one story I have to tell you is that, uh, you know, I can't remember what year this was or what month, but it was back when Jericho was laying all those succession of words on Stephanie, bottom yes. feeding. And, uh, and I would sometimes tell this story in shows, especially when I started the show, about... I would sometimes allude to the words on my hand, you know, uh, that I would write down four or five words. And I started doing that when I was the commissioner because they're just starting to have the authority figure, like not only giving the soliloquies, but welcoming 10 more people to the rings. You've got to become that ringmaster. We have to know what everybody's saying. And I remember my mom asking me one time, like, Mick, how many, how many weeks in advance do you find out what you're saying? I go, Weeks. weeks and she goes how many days and i said 
days. days. And then she goes, well, when do you find out? I said, Mom, there are times the fireworks are going off and we still don't know what's going to happen. So during one of those times, uh, fireworks are going off. I'm writing down a couple words on my hand and Vince comes up to me and goes, no, Mick, don't forget when you're out there to call Stephanie a bottom-feeding trash bag, hoe bucket sleaze. And he sees the look in my eyes. He goes, yes. I said, Vince, th that's your daughter. And he looks at me and he chuckles. He goes, you know, Mick, there's nothing I wouldn't do to get a pop. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man. Uh, but despite the fact they would say these things to each other, I was on hand, you know, when, when Stephanie hauled off and slapped Linda. And afterwards, like, they were just sobbing and holding on to each other. It was such a crazy element, you know, like you could say all these horrible things, slap your mom on live international TV. And they were crying. After. And they were crying afterwards, sure. Wow. Uh, let's talk about maybe a misstep, at least in my view as a fan. I loved the reveal on the Nitro Raw simulcast that Vince didn't buy WCW. It was actually Shane. Right. But I felt like maybe that whole idea jumped the shark when Stephanie bought ECW. <laughs> and I understand we're trying to tell the story of the McMahons, and it makes sense in that vein. But I don't know, man. ECW, Stephanie McMahon, I just loved ECW, and nothing about ECW felt like Stephanie McMahon. And it just. I think a more me. egregious um, penalty would be just rushing the WCW. Oh, for line. sure. Uh, that could have gone on for, I guess it years. went on for a couple months. Should have gone on for years. Yeah. Um, man. Timing's uh, everything. Timing's everything. I also remember being there when that announcement was made and Stephanie was crying. And then I forgot that it had been so personal that, you know, we all love Eric Bischoff now, but his goal was to put him out of business. Put them out of business. And so I have this family that's been, you know, battling, battling through quite a bit and they won. And then there was the, the letdown of now what, and then the, what is maybe a little less. There's there. no one chasing us. Yes. And you can't expect us to run as quickly Fast as hard. we once did. Yeah. So I remember saying to Barry, uh, Bloom, uh, longtime manager, Barry, geez, who produced the, the video, as much as I loved Eddie, Eddie Eddie Guerrero sang the entire song of Shameless by Garth Brooks at a karaoke bar for an angle with Steve. And I thought, geez, I remember if we went over a minute talking, they would cut it no matter how good it was. And Barry said, I think Vince was the producer. And I thought, oh, things have changed. Like, yeah. they're not looking out behind them for yeah. the uncharging WCW. So I thought that hurt the product. and. You know, they they didn't get the truly big names because the true the biggest names were still getting paid. We're still getting paid to sit home and do nothing. D and DDP showed why you should sit home and do nothing because he was the one guy on the Good Turner contract who said, "I want to make a difference," and then it left him wishing he'd just stayed home and collected the check. I think uh, the guy who exceeded all expectations. I think when WCW went down, a lot of fans would say. And I, I would love to see Goldberg versus this guy or Scott Steiner versus that guy or Kevin Nash. Should I write whatever. down my choice of the guy you say is going to be? I don't know if I have a pen here. I don't. Uh, I have my wife's uh, makeup pen, so I'll write. Oh, I can see the, yeah, we're on the same, we're on the same page. I saw you write it. It's Booker T. Yeah, Booker, yeah. Booker was the guy yeah. who exceeded all expectations. Because Booker wasn't considered a big enough name to be getting that Turner contract. He came in, had the match with uh, Bagwell. Bagwell yep. was not long for the WWE. In Tacoma, even though they're in Atlanta the I next know, week. That, you know, I think there was a feeling that we wanted those, not we, but WWE wanted those guys to fail. I love that you really wrote it on your I hand. I did. Like I wrote Booker on my hand. Now, here's the real question. Why exactly do you have your wife's makeup pen on your fanny pack? I don't know. I don't know. Do you even know what all's in there? I do because... Uh, to Welcome to a new segment here on Folia's Pod. What's in Mick's Fanny <laughs> Pack? 
Um, all right, so that's the teeth holder. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the, it's a tooth holder. A tooth holder, yeah. Hand yeah. sanitizer. That holds these bad boys here. Yeah. Uh, hand sanitizer. I still carry around the immunization record in case uh, somebody needs to see it. A few family photos, three or four family. Oh, that's awesome. Three or four family photos. That's old I school. still I do love that. that. old school. Uh, the old school wallet. Buddy, uh, that wallet's been through some battles. Been through some battles. And then the adapter when I realize I'm on a plane and, uh, you know, I want. Different I'm, adapter. Yeah, so it's a different adapter. So that's basically it. And then I've got uh, over here. Whoa, where'd this come from? Oh. What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got a price for the uh, in your house man. <laughs> um, I wonder if we got into Michael Hayes's fanny pack in about 1991, what that would have looked like. Probably a little different. I don't if I know. Had to guess. I remember somebody like saying the only reason guys wore fanny packs was for their pill issues. I was like, no, I can travel for two weeks with this fanny pack. I, you I know? mean, I have heard that before, but I've also heard. God rest his soul, the Patriot Dale Wilkes say when a guy walks past him with a fanny pack with quote unquote gimmicks, he could hear he it. could tell what it was based on the sound. He knew what a Percocet mm. sounded like. It sounded different than a this or that. And it was like, whoa, that is another level of knowledge. Right yeah. There. I, I, man, I don't know, but I would try, you know, I, you know, pair of underwear for an overnight trip in there. Yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah, I pulled that out on Randy uh, when I did Say Yes to the Dress. I just put it in there. I didn't guide them in any way, but when I, I didn't even know who Randy was, but as soon as I saw him, I thought, oh, I can play off Randy. Wrestling equips you for that. You know, you're right. well-equipped to take on any challenge. And uh, someone asked me on the show, like, what's in that fanny pack anyway? And I was like, ding, 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 ding. And I take out the teeth, this, and, I, and I've got a pair of underwear, and the pair of underwear, I said, yeah, it's just a three-day trip. And I Great was line. over with Randy, brother. Great yeah, line. yeah. Loved being on Say Yes to the Dress, by the way. I I, um, I would think also, too, on a three-day trip, maybe some deodorant and toothpaste and a toothbrush? Three days? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Good deal. <laughs> Could you not have just uh, given the old Fernum Schnavitz and do the double underhook <laughs> reversal on the existing underhook? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you do that. I'm a three-day man. Uh, I was upset. <laughs> this is our best podcast ever, and it ain't even close. You had no confidence in this topic, but we're hitting home run. I'm right now. a three day man. Uh, yeah, it's, I, a t it's a shirt now available shirt, at Foley's Pod man. Shirts. Yeah, uh, I look, I I want to save the planet, and harsh detergents. Uh, it just goes to show that if you're washing your clothes one third as often as the next guy, you're doing two thirds more to save the planet. So I uh, I wash those undies after three. Everything's after three days. I yeah. um I appreciate that nobody came through more. <laughs> when it mattered less. I love it so much. <laughs> uh, let's get back to Stephanie. She loses the first and probably only ever father versus daughter <laughs> I quit match at No Mercy 2003. Let's put that in perspective. Vince wrestled his daughter. And he wouldn't put her over. He didn't put her over. Gotta right? look strong. <laughs> no, and the, also when she was getting ready to marry Test, Vince grants Test a match earlier in the night because who doesn't want to be in a fight right before they get married? And so I think I said, I think it was in the second book. Foley is good. Test, you know, once you've perspired, it's hard to just turn it off. And he shows up for his wedding, like perspiring on a level that not even Richard Nixon reached in the Kennedy debates, because Nixon was famous for that little dampness yes. on his, you know, on his upper lip, and mere test just pouring perspiration before everything went south on him for that wedding. Uh, of course, eventually Steph and Hunter are going to get married and have kids, and she's going to start working her way up the uh, corporate ladder. You're a big family guy. Did you ever get to see Steph with the kids? With her own kids? Yes. Only usually it would just be at uh, a hall, a hall of Fame was usually okay. the only time I saw Stephen Hunter's kids. And again, I was gone a lot of the time. Right. 
that uh, they were there and the, the children were growing up. But uh, I'd get like just like the odd phone call. Hey, Mick, uh, hey, we're in Colorado. Did you know there's a Six Flags right across the street? Uh, yeah, I do. You know, and I've got a, just a random letter that she wrote me when she and Hunter were driving around the White Mountains because she knew how much I loved it. I think she went by Clark's Trading Post. And uh, so these are pretty cool things, just the... Uh, the little gift when Mickey is born, uh, or when Huey was born. So uh, she did send us a gift when Mickey was born, and the gift when Huey was born, it was like a small, it was a replica of the hardcore title, but it was about in like uh, six inches, little thing, and then Mickey proudly at age two tells me that he fixed it for me. And I said, what do you mean you fixed it for me? And he had gone and taken every small piece of metal off my replica belt, so I had a brand spanking new looking, worthless le- piece of leather with no title belt bits on it. But she was always good and thoughtful in that way. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you even asked her to write the foreword of the uh, Christmas I did. book. Yes. And what was funny about that, Conrad, is it was coming in a time of our uh, um, relationship as a commissioner and GM, um, wait, I'm drawing a blank here, as I did many times in the ring, and then Stephanie would be there to prompt me with a few key, yeah, with yeah. key words. Carlos uh, Cabrera says, did you say five alarm fire? I said, yes, I did, because yeah. I couldn't remember what I was gonna say, five alarm fire. Um, but tell me, so tell me what we were talking about. Well, that you asked her to write the forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, so I realized as a GM, like, things are different than they were as commissioner. Right. The days when I could just wing it, they're over. But I, I wasn't good at reciting dialogue, and I wanted everything to feel more real. So I realized that if I wrote out, you know, long, lengthy storylines, promos, and submitted it, that I was gonna get some of what I wanted, and as long as I had some of what I wanted, the promo started to feel more real. And that's when I thought Stephanie and I started doing some of our, our best stuff. And in this case, it was one where I, I had written a line in the uh, Countdown to Lockdown book that I thought was pretty heavy, and it was going back through the King of the Mountain, moments of the King of the Mountain where I saw stars, where I got my bell rung. And in every time that I could think of, every televised match where I'd had a similar type of bell ringing, I could find something that, okay, there it is. There's the kick that landed a little too hard. There's the bump I took on the floor where my my head hit the floor. And in this case, I kept on thinking, but oh, they must be missing the shot. Uh, Samoa Joe's forearms, man, I saw stars. It doesn't look like he's hitting me any harder than he hits anybody else. And I came to the realization, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper, I had to accept that it took less and less to hurt me worse and worse for longer and longer periods of time. I had to accept the man who used to be able to take almost anything could now not take anything at all. And the moment I put that period, I think I said this on the show months back, should have been the last time I ever wrestled. That should have been a wake-up call. But I took that line and I incorporated what I said into how far I'd fallen. And Stephanie took what I'd given her and really ripped into me. I mean, really decimated with my own words. But it's one thing to write them down. It's another to hear them from somebody you like and respect. Just really tore me apart. And when she was finished, I said, Stephanie, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes when you have the chance. And uh, so she sits down and about 10 minutes later goes, okay, uh, what do you want to talk to me about? I said, would you be willing to write the forward to my Santa memoir? And she kind of like gulps and catches her breath and goes, oh, okay, that's not where I thought <laughs> you were heading with that. And she said she'd be honored to because when we would talk, she knew how much it meant to me. And this is not something I'll belabor on the show because I know it's not an enthusiasm that's shared by many adults, unless they have little kids or unless it's within that month window of Christmas. And uh, three, four weeks go by, six weeks, and the publisher goes, Mick, I need something. So I said, Steph, I hate to pressure you. I I text her, I hate to pressure you, but how's that uh, 
how's that forward coming? And she goes, it's coming good. I'm almost finished with my first draft. <laughs> and I write back, first draft? Like with a big question mark. I said, I wrote DDPs forward in 90 minutes while I watched television. <laughs> and it was a pretty good forward. But that's when I realized she is who she is for a reason. Yeah. Because she's going to put everything she has yes. into writing my forward as if it was a promo, as if it was an acceptance. You know, she's just going to put her best forward foot forward every single time. And when she submitted it, it was great. And it, nobody had written it for her. She'd written it herself. I really appreciated it. And she wrote something in there. I'm not sure if she ever knew how much it meant to me. She said... Uh, I've known Mick Foley for over 20 years, and in, in all that time, he's never changed. He's still something, something uh, brilliant, something, and somehow charmingly naive all at the same time. I don't think she said charmingly. And then she said, and then she began a new sentence by saying, and if you pressed me on it, I'd say a little bit strange. And I was so glad that she said that because at the time, and it, I'd say it still carries forward a little bit. It was like, God forbid you made someone feel uncomfortable at some moment because of something you did somewhere to right. someone. Like, right. that means you basically can't open your mouth right. ever for yes. the fear of offending somebody. Yes. And that line made me feel so good because I realized, man, everything that's ever led to me being a success has been because of behavior that could be interpreted as strange. Yeah. Whether it was sleeping in my car and driving the 700 miles round trip, you know, to learn to be a wrestler, or whether it was saying to myself, look, I don't care if no wrestler's ever written, actually Adrian Street had written his own book, like, I'm gonna write this myself. That was considered to be like crazy. Right. Like a wrestler's gonna write his own book, any, yeah. any, any uh, performer is going to write their own book. And so I really appreciated her taking the time to include that. And I, and I, I really encourage people to accept the things inside, unless it's a real weirdness, you know, right. well, I don't want you bringing that out into the world. But a lot of the things I've done could be, even when it was my Santa stuff, you know, right. it was total stranger saying like, well, how long, you know, uh, I know you've got to be with your family. And uh, how long will the visit take? There was, uh, I wrote a bonus chapter in the paperback version, and I called it The Girl Who Loved Santa Claus, because I'd never met someone who loved Santa as much as Ursula. And Ursula was a young girl who, who was told would never talk. Uh, they encouraged the parents just to put her in a home and forget about her. And they worked with her, and this young lady, you know, she labors to talk, but she loves Santa to the point where uh, I would say, like, how how did she like the letter? And the mother would say, like, I don't know. She won't open it. She just brings it with her everywhere. Wow. And they so so anyway, as it pertains to being strange, I was just a stranger who happened to be there for the delivery of her adaptive tricycle, which let her ride a bike that she could never ride before. And I I asked after seeing the interest the young the girl took in Santa Claus, I said, would you like a visit? on Christmas Eve, or closer to Christmas Eve. And she kept on saying, I, no, I know you have to be their family. How long will the, I'm sure it'll be a short visit. You have to be their family. I said, I'm not sure how long the visit will take. It might take five minutes. It might take an hour. It will be exactly as long as it needs to be to be the best possible visit for your daughter. And my wife looks at it and goes, you sound like you're crazy. I was like, all right, well, okay. That's who I am. And I'm going to put everything I have into everything I do. And if it strikes some people as being strange, so be it. And I was glad that Stephanie included that because it allowed me to embrace something that other people may have looked back as looked at as being a, a detriment. Well said, Mick. Well said. I, um, you know, I would think it could have been easy for you to think, or a lot of people may have thought when she wrote those words that they that she was being hard on. <sighs> Well, it was it was interesting that she even included it. Right. But it, it really meant a lot to me. It yeah. did. Yeah. Well, if you're looking to make it hard on somebody else, it would mean a lot to them if you would support our sponsor, Blue Chew. <laughs> Mick and I like to think of it as kind of like a hot tag for, for your, your wiener. wiener.
<laughs> Blue Chew is a great sponsor here on the program. If you haven't tried it yet, what are you waiting for? It's a unique online service that delivers you the same active ingredient as both Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. What was that sound effect? It never gets old. The process is simple. Y'all go to sign up right now. At One thing I'm worried about, if, if when it arrives at my house, will it be obvious that it's in some some type of nefarious? See, here's the great thing, Mick. It won't be labeled on the outside of the package. We might even call it discreet. So no one's going to know except me and you and, well, Mrs. Foley. Foley. But while the packaging might be discreet, there'll be nothing discreet about your package. Come on now. Boom. Bluetooth.com. Check it out, guys. <laughs> Sign up right now. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, <laughs> you get your prescription within a few days, daddy. Then you can carry it around in your fanny pack if you want. Uh, the best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward <laughs> conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. It's made right here in the USA. And if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Let's have some better sex, shall we? we got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free. When you use our promo code Foley at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. Listen, uh, Stephanie has been all over the news this year. We know, or in the last 12 months, we know that she decided to take a leave of absence from WWE uh, very quickly. Some news came out that was uh, less than ideal for her dad and the company and yeah. her family. And she stepped up to the plate and became co CEO mm -hmm. with Nick Khan for a bit. And uh, now that Vince is back, she's decided. Hey, you know what? Now seems like I should just finish what I started. And she's back to quote unquote, just being a fan. Uh, I love her contributions for wrestling, not only on screen, but behind the scenes. I've never met anybody who said that they had anything less than a super pleasant reaction with her and interaction with her. She's always doing things for charity and yeah. very warm. She has a way about her. That's very personable where, uh, nobody else in the world matters. She's intently listening to what you're saying with eye contact and a handshake and, with her busy schedule, it would be easy to almost be dismissive of people. You never hear that about Stephanie. No, and I will mention one time my daughter came to a show, and I think she was looking for me, mm -hmm. and uh, she uh, mistakenly walked into a meeting that Stephanie was leading. Not a talent meeting, but another meeting. And I, I said, well, how was Stephanie with her presentation? And my daughter's like, she's so good. She's such a great speaker because she works on it. Yeah, she really works on. It. I'm not saying she couldn't ad lib with the best of them, but she really works on it. And I, you know, I think it's a good time stepping away because once Triple H is back as head of creative, you're talking about parents are on the road a lot, working full time at a time when the girls are in their teen years. Yeah, they need they need somebody. Yeah, I think it's a good time to step away. She's got the rest of her life ahead of her. To me, there's nothing she can't do. Yes. I mean, I might, uh, maybe it's sickening how highly I think of her to oh. some people, but I do. I think the world of Stephanie, I think she can do anything that she, I remember when I told her I was going to be writing about her in the book, I said, do you want to know what I'm going to say? And she goes, Mick, you can say anything you want. Like thinking I'm going to be, uh, come out with something controversial. Right. And instead it was just talking about, like we use that word great uh, too much. Yeah. So you say, ah, oh, great guy, great person. Like, but I think great is defined by somebody who exhibits characteristics of greatness. That's to me, that's her. And so I think she will. I my guess is she'll be back at some point. I gotta think in so WWE. Too. But if yeah. she chooses a different career path, Good I think her. she could do anything that she sets her mind on. Uh, what's your relationship with her like today? When's the last time y'all spoke? Just uh, reaching out to her via text message uh, when she left the company, and then with the uh, uh, ankle surgery. And I'm pretty sure that if I were to reach out to her and say, "Hey, we just did an episode on you." I'll probably reach out when we when we're a couple of days away. Hey, did a whole episode about you. And just send the shovel emoji. <laughs> and then when she'd be like, You buried me? Like, no, that's my new gimmick. When I was babyface cactus Jack, shovels were the gimmicks. <laughs> and okay. we've got a shovel shirt right now over uh, at Folius Pod Shirts. So, really? Yeah, man. They're flying off the shelves. <laughs> They're flying off the shelves. Uh, do you think why do you think Stephanie gets a bad rap in some wrestling fan circles? They're not able to separate 
the on-screen <laughs> character. You know, it's, it's pretty sad a statement is she mentioned to me how surprised and grateful she was that when her dog passed away that all of the comments were conciliatory. There wasn't anyone... Uh, Trash bag hoeing her? There wasn't any of that. But that's sad that you have to live with that. It's yeah. like that that's your reality is that people are going that's to your barometer. say those things. Yeah. You're like, I guess it's an indication she's doing a great job as a... As a young, can I tell you a, this is a story I, I've told about uh, when I went to Canada and I'm doing a three-week tour just of the Pacific, uh, uh, British Columbia. And I don't realize because of the way the tour is that I'm hitting towns that are only 20 minutes apart. And also the guy that booked the towns is doing it because of the success he had with the ski crowds not realizing that those ski towns are essentially vacant in September and October. Oh. So we're going through the ticketing and, uh, and uh, the age, uh, the publicist or agent says, okay, we're looking good. You know, we're almost sold out in Edmonton, two thirds full in Calgary. We've got 180 tickets sold for Red Deer, five in Revelstoke. And I said, did you say five, five tickets in Revelstoke? <laughs> Yeah, just five. So I check with my web guy. He goes, Mick, I don't think anybody lives in Revelstoke. Like, we're not getting any reaction to the Facebook ads. So by the time the uh, show airs, we've got 26 tickets sold in a 2,500-seat theater. Oh. So what we do is I turn my back to the 2,500 empty seats, and I perform to 26 chairs which are fanned out in front of the stage. And I say, hey, I'm a glass half full guy. There's only 26 people here, but at least I'm not likely to get heckled. And the moment I say heckled, this old man's voice rings out. You know, I don't usually associate Canada with Italian immigrants, but yeah. be foolish to think that there is no immigration to Canada. I hear this voice go, I want to know what you're going to do about Triple H. And I said, Excuse me? And he goes, I don't like what he and Stephanie are doing to that show. <laughs> it's like, I couldn't believe this is happening. Like, here's a guy who tunes into the show who is taking the heel personas. To, the way I got I got even with him because he made fe me feel uncomfortable is that later in the show, I literally sang Winter by Tori Amos to him, like this far from his face, because I know he's from Italy He's an immigrant. He's in his 80s. He's not going to be comfortable with no. love songs being sang to him by any type of uh, male, let alone the hardcore red legend. And I'm up in his grill this far going, when you gonna make up your mind? And I could see him recoiling and he was so uncomfortable. I was like, take it, take it, take it. <laughs> That's the thing when you heckle, heckle me and 25 people minding their own business, enjoying themselves. This guy's got to go into business for himself. But that's just an example that, you know, Stephanie and Hunter had, like, real heat. And some people don't know, do not know where to draw the line. Which is crazy because if you sat them down in a room and you asked them what they knew about wrestling and said, well, it was more of a stretch to think that I ran the company right. than it would be Stephanie and Triple H. Right. So uh, I do think at one point I wondered whether it was smart to have the real-life people portraying evil versions of themselves. Right. But, uh, yeah, they, they did have to put up with a lot of that. That's unfortunate. I don't know why she gets a bad rap. Yeah. She's easy to work with. She brings out the the best in people she works with. Uh, she's open to ideas. Uh, she has a work ethic that's second to none. I don't know why she gets a bad rap. Yeah. Um, the whole, you're, I know you're a big fan of a double entendre. Did you know? Has little, to be clever. Little known fact that Blue Chew was once considering take it as one of their slogans. Really? Yeah. Take it. Take it. Take it. That comes from Brendan Burns, the Australian comedian. Take it. Take it. He would say something that the audience wasn't ready to digest. And oh, go, yeah. Take it. Take it. That. Well, I'll tell you what else I love. The idea that next week, I can't believe this is real, we're talking about your time in the UWF. Whoa. Not Mid-South. Herb Abrams, UWF? Herb Abrams. The that's stories, next week? The controversy. We'll cover it all next week. Right and that's when we Foley's start life. our weight loss challenge. The Foley is Pod Weight Loss Challenge. The Mick Foley Weight Loss Challenge starts next week right here on the program. 
Of course, you can see all of these shows early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com. Uh, it's more than a dozen podcasts that you'll get early and ad-free. It all starts at just nine bucks, and now you can enjoy the first week on us completely free. Sign up for a free trial and get a taste of what ad-free shows is all about at adfreeshows.com, including brand new interviews with Gary Juster, and we're digging through Jim Crockett Jr.'s red books, the infamous booking sheets that shows exactly what town, what day, what gate, what matches. It's a peek behind the curtain, unlike anything else in wrestling. It's all available now at adfreeshows.com. And listen, you probably hear a lot of the same commercials on these shows with Mick every single week, and you might say to yourself, self, why do I keep hearing the same advertisers? Well, because it really works. And if your business targets men that are 25 to 54 years old, you can't find a better place to advertise than right here on Folius Pod. With our super targeted audience, there's very little waste. Go right now to advertisewithfoley.com and find out more about advertising with Foley is Pod. Uh, in the meantime, we'd love to have your interactions, man. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Foley is Pod. You can catch Mick over on Instagram at Real Mick Foley. And of course, we've got all of our fabulous shirts, including the now infamous Phantom Ball shirt at foleyispodshirts.com. Uh, but of course, the easiest way to support the show is subscribe to our YouTube channel, Foley on YouTube.com. And don't forget, you got a lot of appearances coming up, Mick, including Dresselmania. Folks can keep up with all your appearances on your website, right? Yes, right. RealMickFoley.com. Click on events. I'm uh, hitting a handful of conventions in the next few months. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing people from around the country. And if you can't make it out to see Mick in person, you can always catch him on Cameo. Cameo. Cameo.com is where you can find Mick Foley. And we're trying to level you back up. we got to get you over this bar stool. I mean, I what, what the hell? Frank the Tank. Yeah, it's still a debate. Whether he qualifies as an athlete or I a say no. head on a I say nay, nay. show. Okay. Let's pull for you, though. Listen, just like we did last week in that poll where you decimated Sting, we're going to pull for you to overcome. But now I want you to continue the conversation because I'm willing to bet on, like, JR's podcast, EB's con uh, podcast, Shivani's, that it'll be like, it's not even close. It's Sting in a landslide. How are we even having this conversation? All right, Bischoff and Shivani are WCW homers. They're right. going to go with Sting. I get that. But let me just say this. When Sting was the top guy in WCW before the NWO, they had yet to turn a profit. Uh, when Mick Foley was on top in the WWE, buddy, they had the money printers out back. But we had Steve and The Rock and Undertaker and Triple H. I get that. But yeah. he had Vader and Ric Flair and a whole host of other folks. I'm just saying, could you just let me give you your flowers on your own damn podcast? Okay. There you go. Thanks. I know it was very uncomfortable for you. He hates taking compliments, but he loves telling stories about the UWF. And that's what we're <laughs> doing next week. Right here on Foley is Pod. Hey guys, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Need to call a timeout real quick here. I wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my world listeners for a while now. It's about all the incredible things happening over on adfreeshows.com. Eric Bischoff breaks down TNA's Aces and Eights storyline like you've never heard it done before on the latest edition of In Depth. I probably came from Sons of, of Anarchy because that show, one of the threads in that show was always who's the mole? Who is right. in this club that knows this information that could literally put us all away for life? You know, who can we really trust? And guys would use that concern about trust against each other for their own agendas. Referee Mike Kyoto opens up the mailbag every other Monday, answering your questions and sharing classic stories like this. And just lick the licky side of my face and grab me and hold me. And I'd be like, oh my God, all that saliva all over my face. But I mean, it, you know, it would get a big pop. And just to work with those guys, man. I'll tell you, never a bad moment with those guys. Never a bad day. If you're looking for interactive experiences, Kevin Nash recently sat down with Ad Free Shows members for a premium watch along event of his streak ending title winning match against Goldberg from Starcade 98. I mean, since I booked it, I should probably know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, that's just. That was just the way, that, that was almost the appeasement that the company, it, nobody nobody did, you know, just clean jobs. It was, you know, so, I mean, to, to me, a double run-in at a cattle prod 
and I, and I get the victory. I mean, it's... Get this and other exclusive experiences, including now being part of the live recordings of the podcasts. Hey, that's just a small taste of what AdFree Shows has waiting for you, including a brand new perk, getting to join in on the live recordings of the shows with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why AdFree Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. That's right. Sign up today at adfreeshows.com.